This is going to be a talk that's in two parts. The second half is going to be about tips for writing better predictive models. Um, it's actually driven from a bunch of examples that, of lessons that the data science and machine learning team as Foursquare has learned over the past several years. In order to understand the context for those examples, I necessarily have to explain to you what Foursquare does as a company. And so I'm going to start with a brief introduction of what Foursquare does. So this is what Foursquare used to do in 2014. Foursquare used to be a location-based uh, a location-based social network, and this is the reason why I joined the company. I, used, I was a very avid user of this app, and I defended my mayorships around New York City with many thousands of check-ins. And when I used the app, I liked the data that the app gave me, and so I eagerly joined the data science team at Foursquare in order to get my hands on this data. So a few months after I joined, Foursquare split the app in two. They became Foursquare City Guide and Swarm. City Guide is a local search and recommendation engine. It helps users find places in this world. And Swarm is the app which continues the original Foursquare tradition of using your mobile phone to check into places. In 2016, the company pivoted again, and this was a much more dramatic change than splitting the apps in 2014. Foursquare started to focus on being an enterprise business, and we rebranded ourselves as Foursquare Location Intelligence. So what does that mean? If you look in Wikipedia, it says location intelligence is a business of deriving meaningful relationships using geospatial data. But the way I like to say it is Foursquare understands where people go in this world. So an example of location intelligence is the project that I work on called Pilgrim. So what is Pilgrim? Pilgrim was born in 2013, and when it was born, Wired Magazine wrote an article about it. They called it the brilliant hack that brought Foursquare back from the dead. And I love this article, but I actually really dislike the headline, because number one, Foursquare wasn't dead in 2013, and number two, what they called a brilliant hack was just a bit of applied machine learning, and it ran in the background of the phone, and it predicted if a user was likely to check into a place. And this was used um, in many, many different places, for instance, we were able to remind people to check into places, because you have to understand checking into places is very disruptive for most users. In order to check into a place, you have to pull out your phone, you have to unlock it, you have to find the app, you have to click on the button of a lot of different buttons to confirm you're out of place, and people can't, or don't always want to do that. That's a lot of friction. And so now with these, with these uh, push notifications, we could have users generate check-ins with just one swipe. We were able to push useful tips. City Guide can push useful tips to people about places that they go to. And eventually, we were able to populate the user feed and swarm with passively detected check-ins. And here's an example from my phone. Um, instead of checking in five times a place, uh, five times a day at places, like I said, that's disruptive. I can check into places once a day, and I retroactively create a trail, trail of check-ins, and I can still defend my mayorship without having being without having to be that socially weird person who's always on their phone. So when Foursquare pivoted in 2016, one of the very first things we did was we took Pilgrim and we wrapped it in an SDK, and we let other companies demo it. And one of the first companies to demo it is a Canadian company called TouchTunes. So TouchTunes is an app which you can use to control jukeboxes from your phone. They have software installed in jukeboxes in 65,000 different, 65, different places in North America. You can buy credits on your phone, you can browse playlists, you can queue up songs which you like. But TouchTunes has a problem which a lot of apps have, which is that people download it, they demo it, and then they forget that it's on their phone after a couple of days. And so touch teams use the Pilgrim SDK to deliver these very precise pings. And here's a picture from my phone. I go to Midtown, I beat my husband after work, and then touch teams reminds me, if I go into a bar I've never been to before, touch teams can remind me, number one, that I have unused credits sitting around, and number two, that my favorite song is on that phone. And if I swipe through that ping, I can play my favorite song. So touch teams demoed this, and they found a huge spike in engagement. They had four times as much engagement, and they had twice as much monetization per user, simply by being able to deliver these accurate pings. So I want to give you an overview of the data that Pilgrim team has, gets to work with. First and foremost, we have check-ins, which come from Swarm. And this is a data source which we know and love, um, and we understand really well. In order to create a check-in, I click on this pin at the bottom of the screen. I get presented with a list of places nearby. They are more or less ranked by the likelihood that I'm at that place. And if I pick one of those places, that creates a check-in for the Swarm app. So the same flow is found in other apps like Twitter and Reddit. 
uh, here is my phone. I'm composing a tweet about how much I like turtles. I click on this pin, which looks a lot like the pin in Swarm. And lo and behold, I get a ranked list of places. And actually, it's, this is generated by Foursquare's technology, so it's the same list of places that Foursquare that you would see in Foursquare Swarm. Remember the example that I gave you about the Pilgrim SDK? I just realized I misspelled Pilgrim, but the Pilgrim SDK. Um, so when a user swipes through a ping to play a song at a bar, that is, we get that data back and that effectively becomes a check-in because that be that's a confirmation that a user was at a place at a certain time. And we also have user confirmations, this passively detected feed. It's an apps like Tinder and TripAdvisor. Here's a picture of the passive feed in TripAdvisor. It's a, it's a feature called Travel Timeline. And you can turn it on and you can see the places where TripAdvisor, using the Pilgrim SDK, thinks that you were during the day and you can confirm and deny that. And so all of this data, which comes from both from our first party apps and also from our partners, I'm going to call check-ins. Um, internally, we call them something slightly different. But for, for the purposes of this talk, they are check-ins. And just to give you an example of the scale of the growth of Foursquare, this is not the amount of check-ins we have. This is the rate at which we're detecting check-ins, and it's growing exponentially. We're currently able to detect 3 billion check-ins every month, and we are active on about 375 million mobile phones worldwide. And last thing I want to say in this introduction is that the Pilgrim SEK isn't the only example of location intelligence. Foursquare partners with a lot of brands with a lot of different solutions. We have an API, which is independent of the SEK. We have an attribution pipeline, uh, which is basically ad tech. We have some media solutions, and we also have an analytics dashboard that our partners use in order to understand foot traffic, which goes to and from their brick and mortar shops. So, Lesson number one is to track the right metrics. I know this doesn't sound original, but it can't be repeated often enough. So let's start with the data we have. We have 105 million places in this world according to Foursquare's database. So we have an in-house database which we own, which we think models the places in this world. Every time we want to snap a user to this place, we retrieve 200 candidates. Um, they are the 200 candidates which, according to a mobile phone, are the most relevant ones and we score them, so we have about 50 different features, and we calculate 50 features for 200 candidates, we get a 50 by 200 feature matrix, we run that through a machine learning model, we create a ranked list of places nearby, and we send that back to the phone. So two things about this flow, number one, everything on the bottom here, this is not an original design pattern, it's, we did not invent it, this is a very common way of, this is a very common pattern that's used to serve search and recommendation engines. Number two, everything down here is actually done server, side, is done server side. We don't keep the database on the phone. We don't do the machine learning on the phone. We do it on the servers. So a, a phone will initiate this process and then it gets the ranked list of candidates back. So example of some of the features which we calculate, they are themselves machine learned features. Here's a pretty picture which comes from an animation for a feature we have called place shapes. And since this is a technical audience, I can finally say this. Place shapes is a Gaussian mixture model. It's a linear combination of Gaussians. Um, it's a surface, it's a probability distribution surface, which is higher where check-ins are dense and it's lower where check-ins are sparse. So every single one of these pink and purple dots is the lat longs, it's the coordinates of a check-in to a venue, uh, to a restaurant in Manhattan, and we're able to calculate this Gaussian mixture model, and furthermore, we calculate the level sets, the horizontal slices of this mixture model, and we can derive what the places of shapes are. And we have one of these models for, all, for each of the 105 million places. I don't want to go too much into all the features we have. I want to say, just as a generality, we have about 50 features, and you can group them. We have place shapes. We have a global index of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth scans that we can create from data that's associated with check-ins. We have information about the popularity of a place, real-time popularity, for instance, Madison Square Eats, or if there's a football game that's happening nearby, we get that information in real time, and that's some of the signals which we use in our model. We have some personalized signals for users, and we have some for time of day, and I'll talk about the time of day features later. So if you're interested in the stack and you want to know more details, because I'm not going to go into any more details now, I encourage you to read this paper that Foursquare published in 2013. Uh, they describe in detail the features that were used then, five years ago, and at the end of the paper, they use these features to evaluate a dozen different models against each other, and they conclude 
uh, that Lambda Mart had the best precision at one, and so in 2013, Foursquare productionized a version of Lambda Mart and shipped it. We don't use Lambda Mart anymore. We actually use XGBoost, but it's still a gradient boosted tree model, so I'm going to be talking about tree models for the rest of this talk. So, my first question was, is you need to be tracking, my first lesson is that you need to be tracking the right metrics. So my question for you is, is precision at one really the right metric to use when you're evaluating these models against each other? So you might think yes, because that is obviously like we need to be accurate, but you might think no, because the way that Stephanie set up this talk, it seems like the answer to this question is no. So the answer is both yes and no. I want to say in 2013, within the context of Foursquare having unified app, it was the right <laughs> metric to track. Now it is not the most important metric. And so what has changed is that in 2013, we had this closed system. We had an app which created data. The data went into a machine learning model, and the machine learning model served the app. And that was this closed system. And so we wanted to be accurate, and we wanted to reduce friction for when people checked into places, and so it was the right thing to look at. But now that the assumption that we have this closed system is broken, we have some people who use our SDK, some companies use our API, some companies just want analytics and they're not giving us any data. And predicting where somebody's likely to check in is actually different from predicting where they really are. So I'll give you a concrete example. We'll go back to our database of 105 million places. Some places are inside of other places. We know that, we model that. Instead of this being a flat database, what this is is actually a database of trees. So every record optionally has a pointer which points to another record, and that pointer is defined if you are a Starbucks inside of a Target or if you're J.Crew inside of another mall. So you have this database of trees, there's no loops, everything has zero or one parent and an arbitrary number of children. So here is a, this is what we call internally a venue hierarchy, so I'm gonna start saying the word hierarchy because I can't unlearn that vocabulary. This is a grossly oversimplified hierarchy from New York City. The real hierarchy has hundreds of venues, but I just pulled about a half dozen for this example. In New York City, there's a building called the Time Warner Center, and I see that people are nodding their head because they're familiar with this. Inside of Time Warner Center, there's a shopping mall. In the basement, there is a Whole Foods, and in the sub-basement, there's a gym called Equinox. So what happens in real life is I could be shopping at H&M, and that means I'm at the shops at Columbus Circle, and it simultaneously means I'm at the Time Warner Center. But we know, Foursquare knows from extensive studies, and it's also intuitive, that the higher up in the hierarchy that we go, the more likely a user is to confirm that they're at that place. And so we have virtually 100% accuracy if we guess that somebody's at the Time Warner Center. Because the Time Warner Center is big, it has a big footprint, we have a lot of data about it. We're a little bit less accurate when we're trying to guess if somebody's at the shopping mall. And we're maybe 60% accurate when we're trying to guess that somebody's within a place at the shopping mall. So if I, the only thing I cared about was precision at one, then I would be incentivized to show the Time Warner Center, the Time Warner Center at the top of every single prediction, because that's what the user is likely to, to, to confirm. However, you have to understand the business value of our data comes from understanding where people go, and also for our analytics clients, we have to understand where people go and spend their money. And so I actually prefer a model that takes a 60% chance guessing that somebody's at H&M than a 100% chance that they're at the Time Warner Center. Furthermore, we have the hierarchy, and so if we know they're at the H&M, we know that they're at the Time Warner Center. And so this is an example where overemphasizing the precision at one actually hurts the business value of our data. And so I wish I can go into all the formulas that we use or the equations that we use for these metrics, and I'm not going to. I'm going to say that whenever we evaluate a, a machine learned model, we actually evaluate it on about a dozen different metrics, and you can put them in two groups. One of the metrics that we look at are the traditional machine learning metrics that you find, that you learn in school, you find in literature. So we look at precision under the curve and area under the curve and, and, and log loss and the traditional things like that. But alongside those data science driven metrics, we have a bunch of product driven metrics. And they answer questions like, are we detecting the right places in a hierarchy, which I just talked about. They also, we also worry about detecting just the same places over and over again. And I'm going to talk about that later. And generally speaking, we, we worry about whether or not our data makes sense when compared to the real world and events that happen in the real world. For, so an example of that is something that happened in 2016. There was an E. coli scare and Chipotle was forced, to, it was in the supply chain of Chipotle and they were forced to close a bunch of stores. 
This was immediately after the Foursquare pivot to Enterprise. And when we saw foot traffic to Chipotle fall in real time, and we published very early, actually at the very end of that incident, in the very beginning of the recovery, we published that we saw foot traffic fall by 30%. And it wasn't until the end of the quarter that Chipotle went out and said that their sales had fallen by 29.7%. And so that's the type of thing that we worry about, because being accurate doesn't guarantee that your data is useful. It's correlated, but it's not a guarantee. So that's the end of my first lesson. Uh, the second lesson is about feature engineering. I put an asterisk next, oops, I put an asterisk next to this because I realize that many people here are experts in deep learning and my understanding of neural networks is that you don't have to engineer features. But if you're not working in that space, feature engineering is really important. And I want to walk you through several generations of one of the features which we engineered at Foursquare. And I'll explain to you the mistakes that we made. So this is the feature which has to do with the time of day. And I'm showing you the same picture that I use for place shapes. But instead of focusing on the top, let's just focus on the bottom here. This is a time series, and it shows the rate at which people visit this restaurant. It's a highly repeatable pattern, and you can see that it will be very useful for a machine learning model. And also, if you just think, if you stand on a random street corner in New York City, the landscape of places that people are at at 11 p.m. on Saturday night is completely different from even 12 hours later, 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, completely different. So time of day is a really useful feature. And our first attempt to encode this into, into a feature that our model used was fairly naive. We just used a bunch of categorical variables. So we had a seven-layer category variable for day of week. This, is, this isn't actually production code. I'm just mocking it up. And we had a 14-layer categorical variable for hour of day. Why 14? I don't remember. It was hours of the day in groups of one or two. And we also already had in our model a categorical variable for the place category. Examples of place categories are like bodegas, nightclubs, restaurants, shopping. And we were expecting the model to learn this complicated relationship between three categorical variables. We were expecting the decision tree to have a path in it that looked like if it's 11 p.m. and it happens to be Saturday, and if you happen to be a nightclub, then people are more likely to be here. But if it's 11 p.m. and it happens to be an office, then people are less likely to be here. And this didn't work. No matter how much data we gave the model, it never learned these types of relationships. And so this, what we were expecting the model to learn, we took that logic and we moved it into the feature engineering side of things. So version two of this feature was to use histograms. And so we took timestamps of check-ins that we detected, we grouped them by place, and we created histograms. And this is an example of one of the histograms. There's 168 bins in the bottom, because 168 is 24 times 7. So I labeled the groups of 7 so you can understand. This is uh, the histogram for a popular Caribbean restaurant, which happens to be a bar at night. And so you can see Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, people uh, really love this bar. And the second version of the feature which we served was simply the height of the normalized histogram. So we normalize each histogram so that the sum of the bars adds up to one. And then if it's Saturday night at 11 p.m., we look up that hour of the week and we say, OK, we're going to serve or the value for this feature for this bar happens to be about that right there. And then all the offices nearby, the similar histogram, if you overlaid it, it would have these really small bars, because hopefully not that many people are working Saturday night at 11 PM. And so now we have this feature, which is better. And we think it's monotonic. We think that the higher it is, the more likely people are going to be at that place, because they happen to be at that place in the past. And before we productionized this, we actually made what we thought was an improvement we treated the histogram like a frequentist probability, and we approximated the PDF using a cosine basis. Uh, there were two reasons why we did this. Number one, it's smoother because some of the histograms don't have that much data, so you end up with like this like really jagged pattern, and the, the Fourier approximation smoothed that. And number two, it compressed the amount of data that we had to serve. Um, that's because we're detecting 3 billion visits, and each visit we have to calculate the score on 200 venues. And at that scale, any amount of compression counts for a lot. And, but we still have this monotonic feature, and it's high when we think that people are likely to be at a place, and it's low when we think that people aren't going to be at that place. And we served this, and it was incredible. It was incredibly bad. It didn't work. 
It added no predictive value to anything, and it didn't stop us from guessing that people were at nightclubs at seven o'clock on Tuesday morning. And so to figure out why, we had to look into the details of the XGBoost tree model, which we trained, and we looked at every single node in this family of trees, and we tried to understand how the decision trees were splitting based on this feature. And I'll try and explain to you what we saw. Here is another picture of the Fourier approx time series feature for two different venues. One of them happens to be an airport. One of them is a fried chicken joint. And you can see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, people like eating their fried chicken at lunch and especially dinner time. Breakfast, not so much. And at the weekends, people are checking into the airports kind of at the same rate that they are during the day. And once again, this is the, for the, the fried chicken signal in particular is really low in the morning and it's really high in the evening. And if you look really, really closely, you can see something else. It's actually not here. Up here, that picture of fried chicken actually isn't a picture of fried chicken. I want you to know it's actually a picture of puppies, which I found online, which I thought looked like fried chicken. So, <laughs> okay, I just wanted to check if people were paying attention. So. Let's go back to these time series. I'm going to replace the fried chicken joint with a restaurant that is not very popular. And the Fourier models look like this. So the airport stays the same, but it looks like it's squashed because the Y values, the range of the Y values is now a lot larger, right? And furthermore, you look at this time series in light blue and it just doesn't really make any sense. We only had, this was a place which had, I think, about 30 visits or 30 check-ins and it just wasn't enough data to get meaningful Fourier coefficients. And if you look at the scale, if you look at the range of this feature, you can see it ranges from about minus three to positive 13. And that's bad because the, the good well-behaved type series, which I showed you earlier, range between zero and two. And so when we were looking at the decision trees, we were finding that the decision tree was splitting on values that were like minus five, positive 20, positive 40. And I think I saw positive 55 in there. And what we realized was that the bad, the unpopular places, these malformed time series for unpopular places were dominating the way that our model was learning. And so to put this succinctly on the internet, there's a meme, it's called expectations versus reality, where people often post pictures of food. It's usually food which they want to make or which they want to receive at a restaurant. And they post pictures of the reality and it's something really awful. Well, we were living in that world. We thought that we had created this feature and it was clever, it used for a series, pretty pictures. And if it was high, then you were likely to be at a place. And the reality was we created this feature and if it was high, the model learned, well, it's really high, and that's because this place really sucks. Nobody goes here, so you have a really mal malformed signal. And that's why the signal didn't work, because what we thought was going to be a timeliness signal was, in effect, a popularity signal. But we already had half a dozen good popularity signals, so this signal was just adding redundant information, and it was doing it in a very noisy way. And so the model just ignored it, and that's why it had no predictive value, and it wasn't helping us. So once we understood this, we were able to fix it, and we did it in a way that I think Jim Savage talked about this morning. We put a prior on every single place, and that prior was based on similar information. So now, if you are a brand new gym, and you've only been around for a month, and we've only detected 50 check-ins to your place, now we can actually seed that Fourier model with, with check-ins at, at gyms that happen to be nearby. And now we can ensure that every single Fourier model has enough data in order to have a meaningful range. And that actually worked. And that's the model, that's the time model that we have in production today. So tip number three is to know your data. Like tip number one, this isn't terribly original, but it still needs to be repeated. It especially needs to be repeated at a place like Foursquare because Foursquare Foursquare likes to brag about how good our data is. And whenever we, we have articles about our data, we always talk about how good our data is in terms of pirate booty for some reason. They always say, Foursquare sitting on this gold mine of data, this treasure trove of check-ins. And they mean two things. Number one, Foursquare has labeled training data, which is incredibly useful. And number two, Foursquare controls the technology which generates this data, because everything we use comes from the API which we wrote or the SDK which we wrote, and it uses the same database which we own. And 
from the point of view of a data scientist, this is a godsend. This is amazingly, this is such a gift. But it doesn't mean that our job is any easier. It doesn't mean that we just take these labels and run it through machine learning model and serve it. There's st still a lot of work to do on our data. I'll give you an example of that. I ran a query last uh, year. I was trying to understand the distribution of four score check-ins. And so I was trying to understand uh, within a six month period, how many times we detected only one check-in to a place or two check-ins to, check to a place. So I have a distribution like this. And this says within our database, there are about 16 million places that we've detected exactly one check-in to over six months. There's about half as many that we detect two check-ins to over six months. There's about a third as many that we've detected three check-ins to. And actually, for any value of n, the number of places that we've detected n visits to is proportional to 1 over n. And I was able to check this globally. It's pretty simple. You take the logarithm of the x-axis. You take the logarithm of the y-axis. You see whether or not your data falls in a straight line. And voila, it's more or less a straight line. And this is an example of a statistical observation called Zipf's Law. It's a very particular distribution. And Zipf's Law, most of you are probably familiar with it. But if you're not, Zipf's Law is a bit like the golden ratio. It's not like the law of large numbers, which is provable from first principles and from axioms. It's actually more like it's one of these things which you see, and then once you learn about it, you see everywhere. And it's just an observation that this distribution holds for certain types of data sets, including the type of data set which we have. So the original version of Zipf's Law, I pulled this from Wikipedia. The original version of Zipf's Law holds for language, where uh, I think it said something like, here's the 30 most, most spoken languages in the world, and the number of times which a word shows up in Wiki Wikipedia has one of these distributions. Here you can see they take the log of the x-axis and the log of the y-axis. And there's a whole cottage industry of blog posts and articles which say Zipf's Law holds for x. It's been shown to hold for NBA scores, it holds for distribution of corporate wealth. It holds for, uh, here's an article which says it holds for population size of cities. So we know that Zipf's Law holds for our ground truth database at Foursquare, but it doesn't hold everywhere in our stack. I took the same query which generated that original picture, and I pointed it at another partner stack, and I saw something like this. I'll try and put this in context. If you remember, on our server, we have 105 million places, and we, we're always trying to retrieve the most relevant places. Well, in our Ground Truth database, we know we have a Zipfian distribution for the distribution of the number of check-ins that we detected. This is a little hard to explain, but bear with me. Post-retrieval, we don't have a Zipfian distribution anymore. If you only have one detected check-in, it's very unlikely that you're going to survive this retrieval stage. And this is a very conscious decision that our server engineers made. Because this retrieval phase, it has to have two properties in order to make our technology work well. Number one, it has to have high coverage, meaning that it retrieves the correct candidate as often as possible. And number two, it needs to be lean, because this is a very intensive computation here. And we know if we start retrieving 250 or 300 candidates, we have instrumentation on our servers. And we know that we start throwing more timeouts, we start throwing more 400s, and that's bad. So we want to have, be, have high, high success with our retrieval, high coverage, and be lean at the same time. And so strategically, we've built into our, into our retrieval process that we retrieve popular places more often. And that's fine. The problem with this is that, oops, yeah, this part right here that's in the light blue, all of this gets logged and it becomes, it gets compared against user feedback and this is used for training future generations of models. And this introduces a feedback loop into our machine learning that's actually pretty vicious. So the feedback loop looks like this. A place is somewhat popular, it gets retrieved more often because that's the, that is what we encoded strategically into our retrievers. If it gets retrieved more often, it gets shown to people slightly more often, and it gets confirmed a little bit more often. And once it gets confirmed more often, it becomes even more popular. And this is something that which we knew about in our technology. One of the engineering managers gave me this picture. He was talking about visit gravity, and his analogy was, was using was, was this picture right here. He said that once a place like JFK was an example, once it got a certain number of 
check-ins, then it started stealing predictions from all the nearby places. And then pretty soon, if you just happen to be in the neighborhood, it always thinks you're at JFK, because a lot of people check into JFK. And this is a problem with our technology that we're able to solve simply by resampling. And so it's very similar in data science if you have a really unbiased data set where you, where you, where you over-represent negative values and under-represent positive values or the vice versa, vice versa. What we actually did was we actually do today is we undersample popular places and we oversample unpopular places in our training data set. And the way we know that we're doing it, or the way we believe that we're doing it correctly, is that we're using Zipp's law as a guide because we believe that Zipp's law represents the ground truth for distribution, distribution of places, of visits to places in this world. And so in order to test whether or not this was working, we actually trained, we trained five different models. Each model had varying levels of aggressiveness in terms of how we resampled. And we plotted something which looked like this. And this goes back to the very first lesson I was talking about. We plotted two metrics against each other. One of them was precision. And the other one is a metric which we internally call place coverage. It's simply the number of distinct places that our technology can detect within a week. So it's literally the SQL queries select distinct place ID from the database of visits. And if you look at the scale of this curve here around the 0.999, that means that we take a 0.1% loss in precision. If you read this across, we get the parameters for a model, which has about 9% greater coverage. So this translated to millions of venues, which used to be hidden by this gravitational pull effect, which we were able to expose. But the cost of exposing it was one correct prediction out of every thousand. And so the data science team was able to calculate this. We call this per the Pareto curve, and we showed it to Foursquare leadership, and we explained to them what the two metrics were, because I think they're fairly easy to understand. And Foursquare leadership picked a point on this curve, which they thought was the, most, the best value for the business, and that is what we have in production today. And so to summarize, I want to emphasize, I am going to, the three, the three lessons which we learned were to keep, make sure you're keeping track of the right metrics. Don't, undervalue, don't underestimate the value of engineering your features and make sure you know your data. No matter how good you think it is, there's usually something you can learn just by rolling up your sleeves and diving in there for, for some time. And so before I end, I want to give credit where credit's due. I didn't do all this work myself. This is actually done by a talented team of machine, learnings, machine learning engineers and server engineers and data scientists at Foursquare. And like every other company at this conference, we are also hiring. We're looking for data scientists, data engineers, managers, and so forth. And so if you're interested, uh, come talk to me. I have four coworkers who are in the audience. They will be at my office hours. The office will be at coffee, so you can talk to us. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. So the question is, how different is our place data from Google Maps? Um, they do like the distribution of popularity. And they do, and they are, in, they are a competitor to some parts of Foursquare technology. I can't speak for the places database. I can speak for the, the accuracy of the predictions, because we have side-by-side -side studies with many of our competitors. and. We probably shouldn't do this, but we have some apps which run SDKs side by side with the, as the competitors of our SDK, and we are at least 10 points, 10 percentage points more accurate than others. So, primarily because we have so much labeled data. Yeah. What, yeah. Uh, so, is there any use case for your product or SDK for events that are sort of like a, a one time pop up event, even though like, they may not have a, a static? presence uh, ongoing, but it could be a thing that like, a lot of people check into as a special event, and what happens to those ephemeral events? Yes, uh, the question was if there's use case for ephemeral events. The answer is yes, though I can't think of an example off the top of my head. Um, we are able to detect those, and often we know about them in advance. And so if you use a swarm app, uh, a lot of times when you check in, if we think that there is a specific event happening, we actually, right before you create the check-in, we ask you to confirm that you're at that specific event. So we do that for a lot, for movie openings. We do that for Madison Square Eats, like I said. 
And so we have that data, and it's in a real-time database that we can pull at any time. As far as the use cases downstream, I, I can't answer that. But I'm fairly certain, yes, there is an application for it. But I don't think it's any of the ones that, when I was showing you the picture of the brands that we have, it's actually not one of the things that we do right now. So 